the first and the second respondents have in fact adduced evidence in this case. My lords, let's be perfectly clear. Let's be perfectly clear what we are seeing here, what we are dealing with here before our very eyes. The first respondent has put in a witness statement. And my lord, I will first like to concentrate on the first respondent. And then at the end, I will make a few remarks about the second respondent. Because I think the first respondent is at the heart of this case. Our agenda tonight is to tell you what happened in court and um, what each of the lawyers are talking about. We have already discussed legitimacy. Just let me run through it again. That uh, this whole concept of where we are in the election petition is, has become longer. This particular issue has become longer because it is a contest within the context of political legitimacy. Well, within the context of legitimacy itself. And legitimacy has basically three strands. It has legal legitimacy, um, political legitimacy, and popular legitimacy. I've said already that legitimacy is a concept in political science. But what happens with these major constitutional law cases is that when we put it out on television, like we have done now and like we did in the last election petition, and like, in fact, we should do in every election petition, what you do is that you have expanded the, uh, the question of legitimacy. What you have done is that you are pitching legal legitimacy against political legitimacy and against popular legitimacy. The only one that matters, which is of real consequence, however, is the legal legitimacy. That's what the judges are going to say. What the lawyers are urging on the courts, within the context of legal legitimacy, is what the judges are going to rule on. But when you put an election petition on television, then the court of public opinion also has a say. Inconsequential say, we have to say, we have to emphasize that a court of public opinion say is inconsequential because the ruling and the judgment is not going to be delivered by the court of public opinion. But the court of public opinion will make analysis, they will make inferences, and they will take decisions in the court of public opinion because they are watching on television. Day in, day out, cases go on in court and we just see it reported in the graphic or reported on, on City Online or Ghana Web or that kind of thing. We don't get to know the nitty gritty, so we just read what has happened and we know what the ruling of the court is. In circumstances such as this, where there's a high public interest in the matter uh, of, a, of an important constitutional issue, you put it on television, then you invite the court of public opinion inadvertently to have a say. That say is inconsequential. What the judges say is the, is the most important thing. So we we're running you through the constitutional process. Article 64 allows Ghanaians to challenge the validity of elections. And that has happened in 2013. It's happening now. The Supreme Court has designed rules by which these elections will be challenged. And they call it uh, rules of court. And sometimes it's, it's in CIs. Under this particular election 2020 rules, the petitioner uh, allowed by the court is that candidate who is claiming that he should have won the election. That person who is claiming that he should have won the election. So if I'm not claiming that I should have won the election, I'm not qualified to be a petitioner. The petitioner is the one who is saying that I should have been the winner or there was something fundamentally wrong with the election. Both of them. So within the context of the rules right now, uh, Ikea Donko will not qualify as an election petitioner because she, she didn't say she was winning the election. She, she's not saying anything about winning the election. Okay, some lawyers disagree with that, but that's the rule right now. The petitioner is expected to file a petition. So when he files the petition, he is expected to then give further statements as a witness himself or tell the court that other people are going to be witnesses for him. At the beginning, we were wondering whether the petitioner must automatically be a witness in the matter. The rules told us that the petitioner not necessarily be a witness. So President John Dramani Mahama, the former president, and the candidate of the National Democratic Congress in election 2020 filed the petition. He filed the petition and he indicated that he had concerns about the conduct of the Electoral Commission. Now the rules of the petition are such that when you petition successfully, the court allows you to sue the Electoral Commission as the first respondent. The Electoral Commission being the most important player in all of these matters is sued as the first respondent. Very, very important. Then you sue the winning candidates, the person who was declared as winner as the second respondent. 
very, very important as well. Okay, so respondent number one is the electoral commission. Respondent number two is the winner of the election. In this case, President Nana Adodankwa Akufuado. Now, President Muhammad then filed a petition, and there were conversations about whether or not having filed the petition, he will issue a witness statement, and then he will have to mount the witness box and take questions. It didn't happen. President Muhammad filed a petition. He indicated that he was going to call five witnesses. And then the petition was responded to by first respondent and second respondent. Okay. Now, after that, the court goes in to settle the issues. So the court asks itself, what are the issues that we are going to settle in this matter? So the uh, petitioners will bring their issues, respondents will bring their issues, they will look at it, and one day the court will come and announce that, having looked at everything, what is most important to us are these issues. And everything that will happen in the court, therefore, must connect. It's a, it's a signal. When the issues are, 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 are published, delivered, it's a signal to both lawyers, lawyers on both sides, I should say, that... Whatever you say, whatever you do, whatever input you make into this case, be mindful that you have to be answering one of these questions in your favor. Anything else you do that does not connect to answering these questions in your favor is a waste of time. Anything that you plan to do, but you find that you don't need to do it so that these questions are answered in your favor, it's a good decision. So be careful about the things you do in the case, the things you say, the things you write, the questions you ask, the witnesses you put up, or in, in this context, the witnesses you don't put up, all of that must be geared towards answering these five important questions that the court has outlined as the issues for the decision of the court in this election petition. Therefore, the question we ask ourselves is that, what are the issues that were determined to be the critical issues of this election petition? I'll show you those issues in a minute. Right here. Uh, so these are the, the issues that the court uh, isolated as, uh, as the, the big issues for, for this decision. Okay, so by court, it says, we accordingly set down the following issues for determination uh, by this petition. Issue number one, whether or not the petition discloses any reasonable cause of action. Now, that's very important. So cause of action is whether you have power to come to court. Cause of action is that whether there's something for which reason you are in court. So if this issue is answered in a negative by the, by the courts, the seven judges answer this in a negative, it just means that they are saying that, look, all what John Dramani Mahama was saying, is it, it discloses no cause of action. Cause of action. What is the point? Why are you in court? Do you have a reasonable matter for the court to even listen to? Is there something that you are saying that raises fundamental questions as to the contradictions of the constitution, violations that occurred, major things that we should look at at all. That is why they asked Rojo Metolulu some questions. That's why they asked Johnson Asidu some, in Katia some questions. All of those questions are directed to bring out the point that, number one, Mr. Johnson Asidu in Katia, Mr. Pesa White, Mr. Rojo Metolulu, everything you are saying does not disclose any cause of action. That's what the respondent lawyers have hoped, are, are hoping that they have done. What the petitioners' lawyers are hoping that they have done is that they have told the court certain things, raised important issues to show that they have disclosed a reasonable cause of action. So what's the second issue? Issue number two, whether or not based on the data contained in the declaration of the first respondent and the second respondent as president-elect, that no candidate obtained more than 50% of the valid votes cast as required by Article 63 of the 1992 Constitution. This is also very important. Issue number two, they are going to ask whether or not the information that the Electoral Commission obtained from the 38, over 38,000 polling stations on voting day, putting all the information together and putting all the information from the regional coalition centers together, and outlining everything that happened in the 275 constituencies, that whether or not in all of that data, the, uh, the respondents, the, the first respondent and the second respondent, that, 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 that the, the declaration of the first respondent, the declaration of the first respondent, that the second respondent had won the election by 50% plus one, whether that is justified. So they, are, they would have to assess that. 
they will have to access all that information. That's issue number two. So once again, when the lawyers are working, they need to know that all what we are doing must be going towards issue number two and must be demonstrating that, yes, indeed, based on all the information, all the data available to the Electoral Commission was the first respondent, the declaration that she made of the second respondent as president-elect and signed it into a gazette, CI-135, is correct. Okay. Now, number three. Whether or not the second respondent still met Article 63 of the 1992 Constitution threshold by the exclusion or inclusion of the Techiman South constituency presidential election result. Now, this issue is also to be sorted out by the court. They're going to say that, okay, this Techiman South issue, the court is going to look at it. Whether or not if you take Techiman South out or if you add it, whatever you do with Techiman South, does Dana Akufuado actually win the election by 50% plus one, which is the constitutional threshold that he needs to get to before he's declared the president? I mean, that last but one, issue number four, whether or not the declaration by the first respondent dated the 9th of December 2020 of the results of the presidential election conducted on the 7th of December 2020 was in violation of Article 63. So number four is that the declaration that was made on the 9th of December, whether that declaration was made in violation of the Constitution, because this is a major issue that has been alleged by the plaintiffs, so that everything that the plaintiffs are doing must come into this one. So you will notice that um, uh, issue number two has to do with the Electoral Commission. Issue number three, whether or not the respondents met, it has to do with the Electoral Commission. Issue number four, whether or not the declaration has to do with the Electoral Commission. A lot of it has to do with the Electoral Commission. And you remember that Nana Kufado, in his response, mentioned that 30 paragraphs, of the 35 paragraphs of the petitioner's statement is spent on complaining about the Electoral Commission. Last one, whether or not the alleged vote pardon and other errors complained of by the petitioner's petitioner affected the outcome of the presidential election results 2020. So, yes, this is the last one. The, whether or not the votes pardon, and that has been discussed in some detail. So these are the matters, all of which have been, uh, all of which the court is going to look at, and looking at the evidence before them and everything that the lawyers have said, whether or not all of these issues have been answered. And de depending on how the court answers these issues, they are going to make a ruling one way or the other. So keep this in mind. This is what the court is interested in. The court is not interested in anything outside these five issues set out for determination. Now the case goes on. Let's go back and understand what happened today. So the case starts and uh, John Dramani Mahama, who said he was going to call five witnesses, does not call five witnesses anymore, but he calls, he settles on first two witnesses and then the last one is included. It's added onto, the, onto it. One, one person is added onto it. Okay. Now, um, the witnesses are called. They, they speak. Uh, Johnson... Asidun Katia speaks, and um, you also have Rojo Metal Nunu speaking, and you have Pesahwai speaking. Okay. At the end of the Rojo Metal Nunu cross examination, something significant happens. Mr. Chikata rises up in court and says, I have closed my case. He says, I have closed my case. Now, upon closing the case of the plaintiff, or the petitioner, it is now time for the respondents to make their case. And then comes Mr. Justin Amenuvo, who is representing the Electoral Commission, and indicates to the court that, in fact, based on everything that has happened, they do not feel compelled to produce Jean Adukwe Mensa. Why is Jean Adukwe Mensa? Why is he mentioning Jean Adukwe Mensa? Now, he's mentioning Jean Adukwe Mensa because Jean Adukwe Mensa it was, who is the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, the sole returning officer for the presidential election, who also signed a witness statement in which she gave some information in response to what the petitioner had been saying. She did, uh, and tonight we'll show you the witness statement. She gave a witness statement. Gina Dukwe Mensa gave a witness statement. So her lawyer, uh, Justin Amenuvo, is saying to the court that we have heard everything they are saying. We don't think that they have disclosed anything important for us to respond. That's what, that's what, they are, that, that's what, um, that's what the, the lawyers for the Electoral Commission is saying. That we have heard everything Mr. Chikata is saying. So I, I, I'm now telling you the two sides that ended today, the two arguments that ended today. Argument number one, 
It's electoral commission that's the respondent. Respondent number one and respondent number two on the same side. I'm giving you their side. They are saying that we have heard everything. We have heard Pesa White. We have heard Johnson Asiedun Katia. We have heard Rojo Metilunu. And given the issues that have been laid out by the court, everything they've said, they have not made any case. They have said nothing. We don't think that we should even confront anything. With what they have said, if the judges should rule, these lawyers of the respondents are confident that based on what has happened in the court so far, there's no need for them to add anything. The ruling will be in their favor. That is to say, the petition will be dismissed and the court will rule that Nana Adodankwa Akufuado was validly elected. They are confident about that. So the case they are urging upon the court is, look, at this stage, we don't, we don't want to talk. We don't have anything to say. We have nothing useful to add. There is something called a submission of no case, which is in both criminal and civil trial, I have to say, where the prosecution or the plaintiff finishes their case and you, the other side, believe that they have made no case. You submit that to the court, that you submit a motion, an application, and say that what they have done, they have said nothing. They have not made any case. They have not been successful in making any case. How do you come to that conclusion? You come to that conclusion by looking at the issues that has been set out by the court. Once you look at the issues that have been set out by the court and you know what they have said, you know they've made no case. So let me give you an example. So Mr. A goes to court and says that Mr. B has stolen my car. Okay. So Mr. A goes to court and says, Mr. B has stolen my car. So the court says, okay, let's hear you. He says, okay, Mr. B has stolen my Mercedes-Benz color red. And... Number GR6869-13 is my car and Mr. B has stolen it. So he calls evidence of his driver. When were you driving the car? And he says, I was driving it on this day. And what happened? And Mr. B brought macho men and they took the car from me and they went to park the car in his house in Adabraka. And that is a stolen item. I've reported to the Adabraka police. They bring Adabraka police as witnesses. So Adabraka police is your witness number two, your Pesa White or somebody like that. He comes and says, okay, it is true. This report was made. We are still investigating. And then cross-examination, Adabraka police are asked, you are still in investigation. Have you finished the investigations? They said, no. Have you spoken to Mr. B about it? They said, no, we haven't found him. And then Mr. B's lawyer says, my lord, there will be no further questions. Okay. Then he comes and they talk and they finish and they say, okay, Mr. B, now open your case. Then he says that I am going to make a submission of no case because throughout this process, this car they are talking about, they have not been able to produce the documents of the car. They have not been able to produce the documents covering the car that indicates that the car is for them. So they have not been able to disclose a course of action before the court. And therefore, the car that they complain of, they have not been able to show ownership of the car. Because before you can say, plead theft against you, you must show that the, the item is owned by you, the chattel, whatever, is owned by you. So the other side lawyer says that, no, they have not even been able to demonstrate that the car belongs to them. So I have nothing to show. In the circumstances, the court may accept the submission of no case and say, Mr. A, you have not been able to show anything. You're out of court. Get out. Your car has not been stolen. We don't even know whether you have a car. We don't know whether the car you describe is your own car because you didn't bring documents. So first of all, when you say your car is stolen, you have to show the documents and you have to show that this car belongs to me. It was registered in my name. It is my bona fide property. If you can't show that, then you also will not be able to convince a court that that car has been stolen. So that's just an example. So when people go to court, they always are able to do this submission of no case, etc. So what the people, the respondents' lawyers are saying is that after listening to everything, looking at the five issues set out by the court, no, we don't think that we need to talk. However, a small matter in there is that Jean Adukwe Mensa, the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, has issued a witness statement. She has. We'll show it to you in a minute. She has issued a witness statement where she says a few things. So the question then is, what do we do with that witness statement? And the lawyer for the Electoral Commission is saying, quoting the rules of court, that you can treat it as hearsay. You can treat it as anything you want. It should not form part of the evidence of the court because we do not intend to put her up in the witness box. Second respondent, Peter McMenu, or for them, Nanaku Fuadu, 
has also issued a witness statement. They also say that based on everything these people have said, they have not discharged their obligation to the court. They have not said anything. So, even though we have issued a witness statement, we will not present Peter McMenu before the court. What then are the questions? So then comes the petitioner's lawyers. Mr. Chikata is arguing forcefully and trying to urge upon the court that these arguments that the opponents are making are not correct. Now, there's a particular clause that they are all relying on in the rules that when a candidate elects not to uh, give evidence, he can go away without giving the evidence. The critical question that the court is going to answer is, by reason of publishing a witness statement, has Jean Mensah elected to give evidence or not? In the view of Mr. Chikata, by giving the witness statements, Jean Mensah has elected to give evidence. It is therefore not available to her to access that rule in the law that a party may elect not to give evidence because by presenting the witness statement, she has already given evidence. Therefore, it follows that she must mount the witness box and give her evidence in chief and be cross-examined. That's the case that Mr. Chikata is making before the court. You have to decide which is which. The court will give the most consequential, important decision on Thursday. So I, 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 I'm hoping that you get it at this stage. That's what, that's what Mr. Chikata is saying. Now, the question was therefore asked of Mr. Chikata. When a person issues a witness statement and he says, I don't want to speak, can you compel the person to speak? Can the court compel the person to speak? That's a question that the, the, the judges were asking Mr. Chikata, some of the questions they asked him. And he said that, given the whole circumstance of the matter and given the important role of the electoral commissioner, the chairperson, it should not avail to her for her to say that even though I have issued a witness statement, I don't want to mount the witness box. The rhetorical question he's asking is that if she did not want to mount the witness box, should she have issued a witness statement? That's the question he's asking. So let's come back to our legitimacy quotient then. So legal legitimacy. All the lawyers agree that at any point in time, anybody who puts a witness statement can decide that he's not participating. All the lawyers agree. In fact, some people even say that if that were so, the petitioner should have, John Mahama should have been in there if, if that were so, because he did the petition and he withdraws. says, I don't, want to I don't want to speak. He should have been the one speaking. So if you cannot compel the petitioner who initiated all of these matters to speak, then those lawyers are saying that you should not be able to compel Jean Adukwe Mensah to speak. The other argument which the court is going to consider is that given the seriousness of the matter and given the role of the electoral commissioner, given the historical basis of the first petition where everyone saw Afarijan in the witness box, and given that Jean Mensah is so important to everything that has happened, should she be allowed not to speak? The court is going to answer that question. You remember the issue of human rights that came up in court that was later withdrawn and all of that. But this is the matter before the Supreme Court that they're going to rule on Thursday whether or not Jean Mensah should be brought into the witness box because she's filed a witness statement. Well, we don't know what the court is going to say. But if Jean Mensah were to come to the witness box, the cross-examination, we believe, would be limited to the document that she has filed. It may go out here and there, but... By and large, it will be limited to the document that she has filed. She has filed that document, and the, apparently, the rules allow her to say that, whilst I have filed, you have not made your case. Because, you see, those people are saying that the burden on, of proof is on the petitioner. It is the petitioner that must show something. The electoral commissioner ought not to show much. They only need to resist the petitioner. And they are saying that the petitioner has not showed anything. All the, what the petitioner is saying, they don't have their own results. They don't know what they got. They don't know what John Mahama got. They don't know what Akufuado got. All they know is that the Akufuado didn't win 50% plus one. Why do they say that? They say it is based on what Jean Mensah said. Jean Mensah said, no, what I said gives Akufuado 50% plus one. If you do all the calculation, it gives Akufuado 50% plus one. So really, you can't rely on what I said because what I truly said is that Akufuado won the election and by the calculation he did. 
What do you have? Petitioners don't have anything. What happened in the strong room? Rojo Metalulu says, they said I should go. And when I came back, she had declared the results. And it comes to tea and biscuits and whether there was biscuits and whether there was no tea and all of those matters. The respondents are saying that given everything that has happened, there has been absolutely no demonstration and a disclosure of a course of action. That should warrant them to bring Jean Mensah into the box. The other side is saying that you can run an election petition for the purpose of development of our democracy and allow the exclusion of a cross-examination upon the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, the returning officer of the presidential election. That shouldn't happen. That's what they are saying. We don't know, but I hope you get it. I hope we have done justice to both sides. Just refresh your memories on what Jean Mensa uh, wrote in her witness statement for which uh, reason that she's going to be cross-examined. I will not do all of it. I will, um, I will just touch a few of it and then we go away. So this is a witness statement of uh, Jean Mensah. Let's go through it quickly. Uh, she's the chairperson of the Electoral Commission. Says at all the four stages, the summary of the results obtained by the candidates are collated and recorded. She gives that analysis not very necessary. The candidates of their agents are present and are required by law to sign each of the forms. She said things like that. The officers in charge of each of the stages provide a duplicate carbon copy of the summary sheet. Okay, she said the results for the 7 December presidential elections were collated in the chronological order outlined above as mandated by law leading to the announcement of the results as captured on Form 13 on the 9th of December and she attaches Form 13. This is the final result. This Form 13 became controversial, but she has attached it to her, uh, her exhibit. It's Exhibit 4. And it's on her uh, witness statement number seven. So the NDC uh, petitioner and uh, the NDC lawyers must have Form 13 because it's attached to the witness statement, which was distributed to all of them. Okay, and then the, the next one is uh, as shown on Form 13. The second respondent, that's Nana Kufado, Jim Mensah says he obtained 7 million. 6,730,413 of the valid votes, while the petitioner who had the second highest valid vote obtained 6,214,889 of the total votes, which was with which, which valid votes, which was 13,121,111. Now, this is the controversial issue. This is the issue that, uh, that, that brought some controversy. So, Jean Mesa is saying here that the true final results of the election are. Nana Kufado got 6 million, 730, 413. John Mahama got 6 million, 214, 889. Total valid votes cast is 13 million, 121111. This is what she's put down in paragraph 8 of her witness statement. And this is what the petitioner's lawyers are saying that bring her into the box and let's deal with it. But this is a, this is a matter of numbers. Not much can change if numbers are correct. Okay. Uh, Nine says. Um, I say that with these figures, the calculations showed that the second respondent had obtained more than 50% of the votes. It was also clear that whatever results were outstanding at the time could not mathematically change. This is the Techiman South issue. Uh, let's go to 10. I say further that it was on this basis that the results of the 7 December 2020 presidential election was declared on the 9th. This is saying that given all of these circumstances, the results were declared as follows. It says, I say also that in announcing the figures, the total number of votes cast had been uh, she had misannounced the figures. Now, she, she indicates in a paragraph 11 that in announcing the figures, she had attributed 13,431,574 to be the total valid votes cast. But in fact, it was the total number of votes cast altogether. And total number of votes cast minus rejected ballots gives you total number of valid votes cast. Percentages thereof are calculated against the total number of valid votes cast. That's a point that she's made. It's in a witness statement. But then they're saying that... Um, that witness statement, um, it's okay. They don't want to bring her into the box. They don't even want to say anything about it because as far as they are concerned, the petitioners have not made their case. Uh, I denied, and then in 18, she denies the pardon of the votes. Uh, where does it end? It says, I say the petitioner is not entitled in 19. And in 20, she says, I believe that the facts stated in this witness statement are true. And so that's, uh, she gives 20 paragraphs of a witness statement and if the court were to rule that she should be cross-examined that cross-examination we believe will be limited to these 20 paragraphs in a witness statement but the uh, lawyers for the respondents are urging on the court that they should uphold their application not to not to invite her because the petitioners have not made their case so 
Uh, I'll end here. This is what has happened. This is where the election petition is. Trust that Good Evening Ghana will bring you everything in the election petition in a way that you can completely understand it.